Richard Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker, sentenced to death for the savage murders of 13 people. He is also responsible for 11 rapes and 14 burglaries. So I fell in love with the Night Stalker, so and I know he killed a lot of people, but I don't really care about that. Zachary Vanderhorst, guilty of murder, sentenced to life. I feel really lucky that I knew love, no love. A lot of people will never have if something were to happen to my husband, I would just continue to live the life I'm living. Nothing would change. And um, I would be hurt and I would be heartbroken, but I would never remarry. Zaid Rashid charged with murder and armed robbery. With him, he was a very smart man. Uh, he was really a beautiful courtship. Susan Atkins convicted of the murder of actress Sharon Tate, stabbing her 16 times and acting on the orders of satanic guru Charles Manson. That's about the time I met Susan. And yeah, and she encouraged me and it did change everything. Married her to spend my life with her. It doesn't matter whether she was in or out. And Men and women have fallen in love with these murderers. Some have even married them and had children. Most of these criminals have been behind bars for over 30 years. How does one fall in love with a convict? I was offered the opportunity to go meet men and women who fell in love with convicts. Some of these prisoners have committed horrendous crimes, whilst others just happen to be there at the wrong time and the wrong place. Whatever the case, I'm interested, fascinated by this love that lives between them. Who are these women? How does one live a love story restrained by prison walls? Are these women happy? Where do they find the strength to love men that are held captive? It's with the intention of answering these many questions that I head to the United States to meet them. Our journey starts in Los Angeles. When you're in love or married to a man, uh, in prison for life, relationships are extraordinarily intense because the men have so much time that they can put forth love letters and poetry and be very, and painting sometimes, and they give this woman all this intensity and all this energy and all this romantic passion that doesn't get satisfied with sex. So it becomes like the knights of the round table who put the ladies up on a pedestal and worship them, and it was, it's called courtly love, basically. You know, there's no sex, no intimacy, just uh, kind of the woman's up on the pedestal and the man worships her from afar. I have interviewed uh, women, I call them killer groupies. Uh, you know, they're not uh, dating a rock star, uh, but they love notorious killers on death row, serving life sentences, uh, and uh, again, uh, I think we are to blame because we have made these men into celebrities. They don't deserve it. They're evil. They're monsters in some cases, but to these women, they're not at all. Well, Richard Ramirez was, um, he's called the Night Stalker. He was a, a frightening, series of crimes. Thirteen people were killed. He was a Satanist. He would draw pentagrams on their bodies and use their blood to write messages on the walls. Misty fell in love with a serial killer who terrified America. meet up in Seattle. She asked to meet her in front of a coffee shop. She's there with her sister. I'm apprehensive about this first meeting. This man is a killer and he scares me. He brings up in me a kind of disgust. But I'm not here to judge him and maybe there will be some part of him that I was unable to see no. and that this woman will reveal to me.
Misty was reluctant to be interviewed at first, as if she was uncertain about sharing her love story. How did you uh, meet Richard Ramirez? Yes. How did I meet him? Yeah. yeah. I don't know, I just got really curious and uh, I started wondering about him. So I watched a movie, I watched documentaries on TV, and then I wrote him. Didn't think he'd write me back, and he did. So I was very excited when I got his first letter. And we started communicating, and <laughs> I asked him if I could meet him. Like, uh, I was obsessed with him. Oh. I'm completely obsessed. How do you explain that? I don't know, just I was really curious first, and then I became quickly obsessed with, I don't know, like, I was really obsessed with him. I really wanted to know him, I wanted to know everything about him, I wanted to know, like, if he really did what he did. I wanted to look into his eyes and really see for myself. Yeah. I wanted to meet him in person. Mm -hmm. Sounds really sick, right? <laughs> then oh. I, fell, I started to fall in love with him. Yeah. So I fell in love with the Night Stalker. So, and I know he killed a lot of people, but I didn't really care about that. I just fell in love with him. And our letters were very um, flirty and sensual, sensual and. Sexual and Richard and Misty first write to each other about their feelings, but their letters quickly become much more intimate. Hi, Misty. Thank you for the nice card and letters. Warmest regards to you and Chloe and Caitlin. So both of you girls are going to Utah. I thought it was only Chloe that went. I do remember the group Berlin from the 80s. They had a few good songs. Do you ever read autobiographies? On music, bands, do you shave your pussy? Um, I like soft, tender, clean, shaven pussy. How many letters did you write? Probably about, I don't know, six, seven hundred? Seven hundred. Maybe a thousand, I don't know. At the time, Ramirez was certainly a guy attracting a lot of attention. Since his arrival at the San Francisco jail, women from around the country, including one of the female jurors who had found him guilty in Los Angeles, had been flocking to the San Francisco facility, even fighting with each other over Richard's affections. So he's like, I guess he's a rock star of serial killers or something. You know, people, women fight over him. I have no idea why. When a woman gets involved in a relationship with a serial killer, most often it's because he's famous. It's much easier to get a date with Richard Ramirez than with um, Brad Pitt, you know, or George Clooney. And uh, did, did, did you leave? Did you date him? How do you call did this? Did I date him? No. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of a date. We corresponded through the mail. Yeah. And so we okay. had like a sexual fantasy type okay. relationship. His fantasies were really perverse. Like, he wanted to tie me up and gag me and blindfold me and uh, F me in every which way possible if he can get a hold of me. And then the day I met him, oh my God, I was scared. I was ah. really freaked out. I was like, he's so tall. He's like, he, like, really, he towers over me. Like, so if you take one of my hands and put one of my hands with his hand, it's, it's huge. It's like, psh, huge. When he was younger, he was hot. Come on. He was hot. You're okay. He had, like, nice way. hair, uh, nice lips, nice eyes, like, really good facial structures, you know. He was hot. <laughs> well, he's like a shark. When you look at him now, that when you looked at him then, pictures of him then, he'd be looking like a decent person. But when you look at him in the eyes, it's like a shark. Right before I bite you, before the eyes roll over white, it's a very intense feeling of you're stuck and you can't move. After many months of correspondence, Misty finally meets Richard Ramirez. Ramirez is a prisoner at the San Quentin State Penitentiary, the oldest prison in California. They are together at last. It was an interesting visit, I'm sure. We talked and then 
He's like, he starts, um, I remember leaning back in his chair and he starts unbutting his shirt. And the next thing I know, he's like, he just, wow. <laughs> and I whipped out his penis in front of me. So it means that you loved him until, until you saw him, right? Because yes. when you saw him, you... It's like someone yeah. took my big bubble and went, yeah. pop, and yeah. it came back down to reality. You just, yeah. Re yeah. Yeah, I realized, I was like, this is, like, I felt like I was in a trance. Yeah. Even when I was on the visit, I felt like, and he was sitting across from me, I felt like I was on in a trance. Like, yeah. he had me, like, we were staring at each other, and I, I couldn't move. I felt frozen, solid. You felt that maybe he, he kind of uh, possessed you or something Yeah, like I that? felt like I was kind of possessed a little bit. Okay. With when I was on my visit. Like, I couldn't move. I was physically unable to just, I felt like he was just holding me, like, down okay. and like, and it's intense. It's the most intense feeling to actually meet a killer face to face and be in love with one too. It's really intense. It's intense. It's intense. After her first visit, Misty never wanted to see Ramirez again. Ramirez has had a reprieve from the death sentence. Executions in California are currently on hold. And yet, there are many here that will never forget the terror of when the Night Stalker roamed their streets. Is he sorry? Hell no, he's not. If he's out, I guarantee he'd kill again and again and again. He'd probably even kill me. You know, that's what scares me. If he ever got out of prison, he'd probably come for me and kill me. Is he psychopathic? Hell yes, he is. <laughs> yeah. And anybody who is in love with him is psychopathic, yes. Much to Clementine's relief, the interview is over. I felt uneasy with these women. I couldn't feel the love, I couldn't see it. I feel like they were more on the fanatical side, like groupies. I felt uncomfortable because of the voyeuristic side of it, felt twisted, perverted. I mean, there was no intimacy, there was nothing, it was cold, there was no love. It was horrible and I felt really uneasy, I wanted it to stop. I feel like I was stuck in something very unhealthy and strange. These women were as frightening as Ramirez to me, and that's scary to me because I find it very dangerous. Next stop is San Francisco. After Misty, the groupie, Clementine wants to meet Phoebe, a woman in love with a husband who has now been behind bars for 38 years. I still think about that first meeting, which was nothing like what I was expecting because I couldn't feel any love. It's true. With that woman, I felt something cold and ugly. And I'm hoping that Phoebe is truly, profoundly and sincerely in love. Thirty years ago, Phoebe fell in love with Zachary van der Horst, a man charged with murder and sentenced to life in prison. In 1975, a man is killed in cold blood during a bar fight. Zachary van der Horst is present at the time of the crime and is found guilty. Van der Horst was one of her best friend's brothers, and Phoebe tries to help him. She visits him in prison, and they gradually fall in love and get married. The years have gone by. She has three children today, all of whom were conceived in prison. Hello. Hi. Nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. My name is Clementine. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Phoebe. Nice to meet you. Phoebe works for an organization that tries improving the lives of female prisoners. In California, her sisters, as she calls them, lack both medical and judicial resources. A team of volunteer lawyers supports the association. 
This is the intern office of Justice Now, and this is an organization that um, advocates for women in California state prisons um, around medical issues, human rights issues, and um, we're an abolitionist organization. For the past 20 years, California has built an economic infrastructure around the penitentiary system. Prisons are profitable. No governor has yet been willing to shake up the system, and the popular sentiment is that such criminals should not be released, even if they have served most of their sentence. For 20 years, nobody got out. No lifer got out. So 20 years, and then when, believe it or not, when of all people, Arnold Schwarzenegger got to be governor, he started letting people go. I was shocked. I was shocked myself, but, you know, he actually started the process of letting lifers go. And I began to see a lot of my friends come home, a lot of people that my husband did time with. I've seen them come home now. And, um, you know, my husband went to the board and was last week and was found not suitable after being in prison for 38 years. He'll go back in three more, which will mean that he will have been in prison 41 years. Oh, I always have hope. I went from a dope fiend to a hope fiend. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I still hoped. Believe me, when he went to the board last week, I was still right there. Yeah, baby, you're gonna get that date. And um, no, he didn't get it. And, uh, you know, you feel like you've been socked in the stomach. But you, 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 you know, life goes on. Clementine is touched by Phoebe's suffering, and she decides to continue the meeting the next day. Thank you. She reminds me of Bette Midler. She reminds me of people like Janis Joplin. She's fantastic. She makes me want to cry. She's great. It's unbelievable. We got here an hour ago. It was strange because there was, it was just so strong. It was incredible and impressive. She's so great. She is extremely happy that we're going with her. And since we're going, she's coming. It's beautiful. There's such a strong energy up there. It's nothing like everyday places. It's not cold, like when you meet in a restaurant. You can feel there's... It's amazing. Thank you, guys. Phoebe takes us to see her daughter, Mariana, and her grandson, whom she describes as her ray of sunshine. Surprisingly, Mariana tells us that she has excellent memories of her childhood. And do you think you had a kind of a, a special life I mean, very different from other kids when you were little and you went to, to see your father? Do you think it's really something... Uh... Oh, yeah. I don't know. As a kid, I guess, growing up, I thought that I was normal because yeah. we were there so much. I thought, like, everybody's parent yeah. was in prison. I don't know. Like, <laughs> And then now, you know, I see, like, that's not normal, being at a prison. Like, uh -huh. But it was so homey. I don't know. I never... I don't know. It seemed homey to me. It seemed home to me. Even now, when I look back, I can't think of any bad memories ever going to visit my dad. He always was happy to see us, and we were always so happy to see him. So, I don't know. Maybe I did have a different life, but at the time, I don't feel it was different. I felt that was normal, that every, all the kids were like that. After years of visiting her husband in prison, Phoebe has a collection of souvenirs and memories. The, the, this is Thanksgiving in 2008. Marianna's not in this picture, but she's in others. And this is my two older daughters, Alana and Taisha, and my grandchildren, Azani and Anila. And I and I and this is this this is something that um, a fellow prisoner made a gift. I have this little book. It'll be filled up pretty soon, but um, anyway, and that, that's, that's my husband, and this was us back in, I guess, what, 2006. <laughs> this was Christmas. This is Mariana. This is her. Oh, yeah. That's a really great yeah, picture. I remember that time. 
Yeah, it's a really great picture. I've never seen three little girls so happy to go to a prison. <laughs> I, I, I gotta fill the rest of it up. <laughs> we used to be so excited to go. <laughs> I find it unbelievable to meet a woman whom I barely know and who speaks with such generosity and trust. I feel like we've been friends for years and I'm really, really eager to see her again tomorrow to hear more of her story. Zachary Vanderhorst has served time in several prisons and Phoebe wants to show us the one that meant the most to her and her husband. She takes us to Tracy, a hundred kilometers from San Francisco. It's a road she has traveled hundreds of times. It, it's like the trip in itself brings back memories of my mm. girls when they were babies and mm. growing up. It brings back memories of when I got married and when we had family visits and I used to see my husband every day and, mm. you know, my kids were really young and Oh, it was, it, it just, you know, and it also brings up, you know, the pain of having no hope. And it also brings up drug addiction, which is something that is really important to me that we discuss in this because um, I was a drug addict. I don't want to sanitize anything. Mm. You know, it, 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 it is what it is. The vermin in the building, no teeth. <laughs> drug addiction I, I mean y y you know it is what it is and, and to try to pretend that oh you know it's all you know everything's all good and it, it's not it, it, it's not all good so this trip is like really making me go back memory lane yeah. and it's making me think about all the trips mm -hmm. that I, I took up here. And some trips, you know, I had drugs with me and I had to figure out, you know, how exactly I was going to do what I was going to do. And I, I, and other times, and I can remember driving up here to get married. And, and I can remember just the whole way there, I was snorting dope out of a Visine bottle, drinking brandy, and driving a Dodge Colt with a Mickey Big Mouth between my legs, you know, working the stick with the beer, just getting as fucked up as I possibly could. I was young, and it was painful to love somebody in prison that had you know, no date for release. As we arrive at the prison, Phoebe is overtaken by memories. This is where she got married and conceived her children. That's DVI. This place was the child care center and it had a wonderful program for children. Hundreds of children came through here and played with each other, did art, um, swam, you know, enjoyed their holidays, had a structured visiting with their parent. You know, you, you drop your kids off here and then they would bring, after lunch, they'd bring the kids back into the visiting room. You said? that it was the most beautiful years of life. Yeah, the most beautiful years of my life. The best times, for sure. On the way back, Phoebe takes us to a diner, her oasis, where she usually stopped after her prison visits. I love this place. This is one of my, my favorite restaurants, even though it's not a restaurant. Um, years and years ago, it was a fruit stand and a nut stand, and there was a crab lady and beer and wine. That's what it was. And my family and I used to come here. I used to bring my little girls, and we used to sit right here at this, oh, table, at this table, right here at this very oh, table. And we just had some of our happiest moments here. By contrast, Phoebe truly loathes San Quentin prison. Zachary, her husband, was here for three years until 2009. She only has bad memories of this prison. 
back behind there, people are getting raped. People are getting beaten up. People are being tortured. People are being humiliated. People are being used as slaves for the state. You know, nothing good is happening back there. The one peaceful haven she found near the prison was this small beach where she would rest after visiting hours. Oh, this beach was so important to me. I, I have spent so much time down here. And when my husband went to the board here in 2009, they wouldn't let me in the boardroom. So I came down here and I sat on this beach and just waited. And so, yeah, I've been kicked in the ass on this beach, but at least if you're gonna be kicked in the ass and be kicked in the guts, this is a gorgeous place to, to be <laughs> kicked in the ass and kicked in the gut. Phoebe's life is a mixture of hope and disappointment. Maybe next time the prison administration will agree to free Zachary. But how does she imagine life with her husband? Oh, I would be really, really happy. I, I mean, I know I would be really, really happy. We'll be really old. If he were released in three years, like, we're going to be 60 and 61. So we're not exactly going to... Um, <laughs> not exactly how to be doing what we did when we were younger. I mean, you know, I mean, you get old. But no, I, I, I think that um, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that whenever my husband gets out, if we're 90, I'll be doing the happy dance. You know, if something were to happen to my husband, I would just continue to live the life I'm living. Nothing would change. And um, I would be hurt and I would be heartbroken, but I would never remarry and I would, I would never have another relationship. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not there. It would just not happen. Um, no. One marriage, one husband, that's it. <laughs> I feel really lucky that I knew love, no love, a lot of people will never have what I, I know people that spend their whole life looking for something that that I have so and no matter whether I see him or I don't see him whether he's in prison or he's out of prison it matters not to me because my feelings don't change at all She's part of my family now. It's like I'm meeting these people that become a part of my family. The memory I have of her is one of love. She told me of an incredible, exceptional love story. And when she says she's lucky, she means it. Many people say they're lucky because that's their perspective on life. They fight against hopelessness. But she is fighting alone and she has almost nothing. So there it is. I think of her and I love her very much. She's in my heart and will always be there. We hit the road again, this time for Los Angeles. It's 600 kilometers. We have a new meeting, this time with a man. James Whitehouse is one of the rare men to fall in love with a criminal sentenced to death. Her name is Susan Atkins, and she's well known. She was part of the Charles Manson family. Susan brutally murdered actress Sharon Tate, the wife of filmmaker Roman Polanski. Susan is then a 17-year-old disturbed teenager. On a powerful LSD trip, she commits a bloody murder. I remember that I had absolutely, I could have, I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing for her. Um, and she begged for her life and for the life of her baby. And, uh, The infamous Woodstock Festival takes place at the same time. 
the hippie movement is at its peak. Sharon Tate's murder marks the start of its decline. I think Manson is uh, fascinating in the world because he was the guy that killed the 60s. You know, Charles Manson, once the uh, crimes happened, it changed everything. It was, it's almost like an early version of 9-11. Before that, you were able to live without locking your doors. You know, after Charles Manson, the boogeyman, you started locking your doors, you started looking at things. And so it changed the way we think about society. The world changed when he did this crime. It was so big that it affected a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Even today, I think you say Charles Manson, everyone knows who he is around the world, you know? He's almost kind of like uh, a Pol Pot. In August 1969, Charles Manson, a satanic guru, sends those he calls his family on a killing spree, whose atrocity will shock the United States. The attacks take place at Roman Polanski's property overlooking Los Angeles. Susan Atkins, Charles Tex Watson, Linda Kazabian and Patricia Krenwinkel commit an appalling massacre, violently stabbing the five victims to death. Susan has no pity for Sharon Tate who is eight months pregnant. She writes pig on the front door with the actress's blood. Charles Manson sees it as a success. His revolution is underway. The very next day, he sends out his followers to carry out more executions. You know, to understand Charles Manson, you really have to understand the culture of the 1960s. Everybody was talking about revolution, race war. They were dropping out. They were drugging out. Uh, and that's what he did. He was a guru. He led young people into the desert, uh, and they thought he was deity, Jesus Christ. So they would do just about anything to please him. And you know, even today there are at least hundreds, maybe even thousands, of people who've continued to follow Manson. Susan Atkins writes the horrifying story of the Manson family in her book. She explains how she felt at that time of her life, and how she later realized the full horror of her acts. I remember getting in the car with Tex and Tex my, Watson. Tex Watson and my other two co-defendants, three co-defendants actually. Um, and before I ever got in the car, Tex and I had our own special little stash of uh, cocaine. You know, I think it was cocaine or methadrine, I'm not sure which. We were with speed and we both snorted some speed and got in the car. We were very, very wired. She's incredibly sensitive. She's in another dimension. She's unlike most of us. Her voice is incredible. Her voice is soft and incredibly pure. She has the face of a saint. She says they want powerful drugs, but it's really striking because she looks like the Mona Lisa. She looks like a Madonna. And we drove to the house uh, with instructions to kill everyone in the house. From Charlie? Yeah. Um, and not just that, but that we were instructed to go all the way down every house, hit every house on the... Down the street? On the street, yes. And kill all the people kill in all those the houses? all people in all those houses. You can feel she really wants to. You can feel there's a real hope there. It looks like she was just released and is being interviewed. The man who falls in love with Susan Atkins lives in San Juan Capistrano, a small town off the Pacific coast, about an hour away from Los Angeles. James Whitehouse lives here in a small house, full of memories of Susan, the one and only love of his life. Hello, nice to meet you. My name is Clementino. Nice to meet you. Those are great photos. So you took it in uh, in prison? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
It's nice because she's smiling, but also he yeah. says that there's police all around the house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And she's got the, the L.A. County bracelet on. Mm -hmm. And I like it because now when, when they talk about it, they insist, oh, no, she never helped us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, I got the picture of him. When I was younger, I used to tell people, well, yeah, me and Susan have a good relationship, and, I, and I'll tell you the secret. And as I got older, I realized there's no secret. You just, you're either blessed, it's a blessing, you know. You can have all the, the best intentions in the world and things just don't, even out here, things don't work out. I don't know. I do think one of the things about having a good relationship is appreciating what you have. Um, and luckily we were in a situation where I knew at any moment someone could, could transfer her 400 miles away. Mm -hmm. And we only had a couple hours a week and I took that seriously. and. and in 24 years, I don't think we ever had a fight. The 1960s. Peace, love, sex, music, drugs and alcohol. James was burning the candle on both ends. I don't know if I had any friends at that time. I'd alien. I hadn't, I hadn't mistreated my family but I just got so far away from him I wasn't control I wasn't in con you know contact with them and and I honestly don't know if I had any friends at that point and uh, um, you know when you're partying and you're doing drugs you just drift away and those become important and your friends become less important and uh, which isn't the way you want to live your life you know you can do that if you want and then you don't end up with friends or you can treat your friends as acquaintances and that's what you get She's just had in 1985, James sees Susan on television. She makes an impression as she speaks out against drugs. Two years. Susan Atkins feels that her horrifying experience with drugs can be a lesson to those that use them or think about using them. He decides to meet her and give his life a new meaning. And, yeah, and she encouraged me, and it did change everything. Um, so, yeah, I usually say that she saved my life. And, it's funny because occasionally people ask me, um, say, oh, that's, that's interesting. You married her to, or you went to law school to get her out of prison, or you married her to get her out of prison. And I always say, well, no, I didn't marry her to get out of prison. I married her to spend my life with her. It doesn't matter whether she was in or out. And so it was important for me to, to, um, to that wasn't important. The important part was spending time with her. And just the same, it was important for her to always expect to come out and not give up. The authorities never challenged hostile public opinion over Susan's possible release. Despite her remorse, she was never freed. When I went to find a, an attorney to, to represent us, I couldn't find anybody uh, that had the guts to, to have a suit against the state. Um, there's just so much red tape and, and so I said, well, heck with this, and I took the law school aptitude test, and, and I got accepted, and I went to Harvard. And when I came out, I helped Susan. That's what I did. And so people yeah. say, oh, why'd you go to, well, I, I went to help her. And so I learned to do the parole law really well. And after a couple of years, Susan had a lot of friends all her life. Yeah. Lifers were going through the same stuff, and yeah. Susan said, you already know this. Why don't you help some more people? James received his law degree from prestigious Harvard University in 1997. He believes Susan was the one that supported him, pushing him to his intellectual limits. So this is my diploma from Harvard. From Harvard? Harvard Law School. And I can't read it because it's all written in Latin. <laughs> but I know it says Harvard. I know it's got my name. It says I graduated with honors, so this is a, this just shows me that I can, or shows you that I can practice in any court in California. And then I can also practice in the federal district courts. And this is, says I can practice in the Ninth Circuit. And this is a court that I took Susan's case to. And I was able to argue in front of them, which was pretty, pretty neat. Not a lot of people get to do that. Well, originally when I redid the entire house, all these things were in frames and I had them all up against the walls. And I kept them up there for a couple days, and then it, I just took them down and I put Susan's pictures up, and Susan's pictures have stayed up, and I put these away.
James and Susan were together for 25 years. 25 years of happiness despite the constraints of the prison system. When you're in an environment like that, two things happen. One thing is that you don't have time for little stuff. You know, it became obvious that, that at, a, at a whim, someone in Sacramento could transfer her 400 miles north. So I really, you know, uh, the time we spent together was important. So we didn't argue about little stuff and we appreciated it. I'm afraid that regular people and their relationships, what, what damns them is, is the fact that they, they come to take them for granted and, and, you know, and that we didn't have that have to worry. The other thing is we spent a lot of time talking. There wasn't TV, there wasn't distractions, and, and so you really find out more about the other person and, and you find other ways of, of being intimate, emotionally intimate instead of just physically intimate. And... In 2008, Susan is diagnosed with brain cancer. James fights by her side for over a year. But on September the 24th, 2009, Susan dies. The day before she passed away, I spent most of the day there. And then the day she passed away, I spent, you know, way into the night. As a final tribute to Susan, James scatters her ashes in many places throughout the United States. If her family had had a family, a place where they, you know, generations and generations, that would have been different. And, um, and I, I wanted to take her around the country, places that we never got to go. and. Um, and I'm still doing that, it's, a, it's fun. And... Ever loyal to Susan, James continues to keep her memory alive through his website. And he carries on the mission she entrusted him with to help destitute prisoners prove their innocence. Great. Thank you very much. You have a safe trip back, too. Yeah, thank you. Do I have to come back to meet myself? you? Yeah, yeah, we'll take it off. <laughs> and uh, everything good for you, as thank I told you, and, and we'll Same think about you. you that, yeah, thank you. Oui, ben merci, hein. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to meet such people. It's astounding. It's an amazing trip. We're going back through all these memories and reliving them. He gave us a lot. He really likes to talk about it, and at the same time, you can feel it's emotional for him. And everything he said about the prison system is so true. How long did you say he was there? 40 years? That's quite something to take in. <laughs> Susan Atkins did what she did. And it was horrifying. And then she becomes someone else. And that's because of the love that she went and sought, which she found through religion. And then through the love of a man who spent his life by her side in prison, which truly transformed her. James is a very special person considering everything he did for her. He became a lawyer. How incredible is that? And you can still feel her presence. He's really an example of a true man, of a person, of a human being, because he's devoted his entire life out of love for this woman, who was incarcerated, guilty or not, murderer or not. And he had a lot to give to someone he loves. We leave the West Coast for New York City. Among the turmoil of the city that never sleeps, we meet a woman who lived an intense love story with a criminal who is behind bars. Asha Bandele is a writer, a poet, and a journalist. This highly cultured woman and TV celebrity fell in love with a man charged with murder, and whom she later married. Her experience led to her writing a book, The Prisoner's Wife. Her husband, Zaid Rashid, was born in Guyana, but grew up in the Bronx in New York City. It's here in the city's poorest neighborhoods with a mixed population that street culture was born, rap and hip hop, but they're also plagued by gang wars. At 17 years old, Rashid already has a reputation after committing a number of armed robberies. In 1987, he is arrested for murder and is sentenced to life. Asha still lives in the Bronx. She and Rashid have a daughter named Nisa. Asha still fondly remembers her first encounter with Rashid. I was a student at the City University of New York and I was studying um, 
about why so many black people were going into the prison system. And I went up to a prison to talk with people up there and learn more about it. And I met the man who had become Nisa's father, my daughter Nisa, um, during that period. And there were a lot of us, a lot of my friends and I were going up at that time. And so we all became friends with him. He was a very smart man, very charming. And it was like, we couldn't understand why he was staying in jail so long. When he was 17, he participated in the best way I can explain is like a gang related murder. And so that even if you don't actually do the crime, if you're there, you can still be considered a felony murder. Mm. And, in, and that gives you a long period of time in prison. He got, when he was, I guess, 18, sentenced to 20 years to life. Love is irrational anyway. So it's easy to understand how a decent woman could fall in love with maybe not so decent a man. And then let's not forget that not all of the people in prison are evil. Some of them aren't even guilty. Uh, so it, it, it's not that hard to understand how uh, uh, women do uh, you know, become attracted uh, to incarcerated criminals. We were friends for about um, about two years before I felt like I was really falling for him. And in a certain way, I guess in a way, it's sort of like um, people who meet online now and who may email back and forth. We wrote letters for a long time. And so it was a very slow courtship. If you consider the way that women fall in love now or the way I've fallen in love at other times, here it was months and months of writing letters, of talking on the phone, of really exploring who we were as people. So it was, uh, it was really a beautiful courtship. And I don't think we get to be courted so much anymore. Everything moves very fast out here. You know, one day you meet, the next day you're dating, the next day you're married kind of thing. And here it was, it was slow and really it forced us to get to know each other. After many years of meeting inside prison walls, the love was there. And for Asha, marriage was simply the next step. The marriage was in the prison um, a little over five years after we'd met. Um, and it was, it was kind of sad, you know. Um, it was very lonely. It was very isolated. Um, I remember being angry that day and crying a lot because I was alone. And I wasn't going to be with my husband at the end of the day. And so it wasn't a great experience. It wasn't a joyous experience. But um, it got to a point where I couldn't be his girlfriend, if you will, and still be protective of him. You have no legal rights. There was no way for me to be protective of him in this girlfriend status. So being married is almost what you have to do in order to have a relationship to somebody when they're in prison. But in New York State, for for many prisoners, you're able to get conjugal visits, which means you're, you are housed on the prison grounds itself for about two days. You have a private two-bedroom trailer where you can cook and everything else. It really gives you a time to be intimate, be together, do things that a normal couple would do. We cooked a lot together. We danced. It was a very, it was a very beautiful time. It was a very beautiful time. During this period, the couple is allowed to live a nearly normal life. A child is born, Nisa, a cute little girl who only ever knew her father behind bars. Nisa went up to the prison for the first time when she was two weeks old. And we did that for a number of years. We went up to the prison until she was about five. But guards are so repugnant and so mean that there came a point where I could no longer bring my daughter into this circumstance. I couldn't bring her around the hostility of the situation where uh, men would talk to me, guards, you know, any way that they wanted to say disgusting things to me in her presence. They used to harass me when Nisa was a baby because if I needed to bring in four bottles of milk, they said, no, it can only be three. I know, but I would know what my daughter would eat. So they just, they were almost, it was almost criminalizing her. I didn't want her in that situation or I didn't want her to witness me being spoken to in a way where I couldn't do anything about it. So, which would be modeling for her you know, women can be treated a certain way with no recourse and no voice. So eventually we stopped going up because we just, it was just, a, it was an unpleasant situation. I got angrier and angrier and angrier. And um, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't do it anymore. Nisa was never upset by this experience. In fact, she actually has rather fond memories. It wasn't like a lot of my other friends experienced with their fathers, even if they didn't live with them. 
and it almost seemed like I wouldn't have a good time, but even but I still felt happy to see him. And it was it didn't feel bad to me, even though he was in prison, because we still got to do a lot of the things that they got to do. We still played games. We couldn't go out places. We could still have meals together. And it really didn't affect me, like, in a bad way. So I never, like, I, I would feel, like, shy to tell people, but I would, ne I would never feel ashamed that he was in jail because, I mean, we always had good experiences. After completing his prison sentence, Rashid was released. But things didn't go as planned for Asha and her daughter. Yes, he was released. Um, he actually, I think it was actually in 2007 that he was finally given parole, but he was paroled to um, the, the Immigration Naturalization Services. When, when I married Rashid, he had told me very clearly that he would never be deported, that that had been an issue that had been taken care of. After I had the baby, as it turned out, the INS came for him, and he was deported finally in September of 2009 back to the country of his birth, uh, uh, Guyana. But Asher's disillusion doesn't stop there. Rashid started a new life. He's changed his name. I, you know, he's married again, you know, to somebody who's there. And, you know, we live our separate lives. So it's separate lives, but that was a particular time that I'm grateful for because not only did it provide me the greatest love and joy of my life, my daughter, it also showed me what real love could be. Asha writes about her experiences in two books. In the first one, she speaks of her relationship with Rashid in prison. In the second, she tells of the shock of separating from the love of her life. Even though it was an experience that was never easy, she fully accepts the life that she chose. It wasn't an easy decision. And there's a lot that I would like to forget. But I would take everything again and every hardship, if I could have it, with me so again. So it's worth it, because I have my daughter. Even though she was emotional, and so was I, there's still this light which says, that's the life that I lived. And even if he doesn't want to see us anymore, it was still wonderful. That's an example of love, of compassion. I'm very happy that people will get to see what I saw, that they will meet the people I've met, because they are true examples of humanity. These individuals show true character, they show true strength and love, and what it means to give of yourself. All of them shared their experience with us, with immense, uh, immense trust. It makes me feel hopeful about humanity, about what people are willing to give and to receive.